uh, welcome to the second part of the of this program, New Paradigm for New Normal. And in this part of the program, we will do the Dean's panel. And I will give the, the word to uh, Dean Joy Phillips from Seattle University, who will moderate this part of the session. Thanks. Joe, please. Thank you, David. And uh, welcome, everybody, to the panel discussion of the deans. Uh, we have four deans. Um, they will each uh, start off by talking about something around implementation of the new paradigm. Uh, I'm going to ask each of them to uh, very briefly talk a little bit about themselves in terms of uh, their career in Jesuit education and uh, the scope of their business school and their university so you have a sense of, of what they're operating and what their environment is. So. Uh, first, we will uh, start off with uh, Donna Rapacholi. She's the Dean at uh, Fordham University's Business School. And uh, Donna, I'd like to turn it over to you at this time. Thanks, Joe, and thanks everybody. Uh, this has been a great morning. I especially want to thank Nikki and Michael Pearson uh, and David for really doing a great job um, organizing this. So thank you all. So uh, I have spent my entire career in Jesuit education. I am an alumna of Fordham, and I left for a while to pursue a master's and PhD, and then I came back as an accounting professor, and I spent many years teaching accounting. In 2007, I became the dean of what was just the undergraduate program, and then in 2015, we unified the schools, the graduate and the undergraduate, and I've been serving as the dean of the Gavelli School uh, of Business since then. Just briefly about Fordham, uh, we have uh, three campuses in New York, two are technically in the city, Manhattan and Bronx. We also have a campus in Westchester and we have a campus in London. There are nine schools, uh, over 17,000 students, 10,000 of which are undergraduate students. Uh, as far as the Gabelli School goes, we have 2,700 undergraduate business students, which has been huge growth, and about 1,300 graduate uh, business students. Uh, you can see that uh, the centennial uh, is being celebrated. Our school was founded in 1920 as an undergraduate program, with uh, the graduate programs being added in 1969. So that's a little bit about me, about Fordham, and about the Gabelli School. Oh, and we have 130 fabulous faculty, full-time faculty. So now I'm going to turn it over to Rudy. Okay, uh, it's almost midnight in Manila. Uh, I'm Rudy Ang. I'm the Dean of the Graduate Business, business Ateneo. There are five universities in the Philippines, all of them named the Ateneo. Ateneo de Manila, where I am, is the flagship of the five, we'd like to think. Set up 162 years old by us. Uh, 162 years ago by Spanish Jesuits. Uh, we like to describe ourselves as a small school with a big clout in the Philippines. Maybe just to give an idea of our clout, four presidents of the Philippines are alumni of our university. Uh, the national hero, Jose Rizal, is a graduate of our university. We're a liberal arts university, but 40% uh, of our undergrad majors are in business. That's out of 10,000 undergraduates, about 40% are in the business school. And of our 4,000 or so graduate students, 50% are in the graduate school of business. I've been teaching for 38 years. I've been dean for the last 17 years. And I think that's all I'd like to say about Ateneo and myself. So Joseph, you're next. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel. My name is uh, Joseph Frank. I'm the Dean of the Sade Business School uh, located in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, you know, I joined Sade as faculty member uh, back in 1988, so it's going to be 32 years at the Sade right now, uh, coming from industry. And before that, I was a graduate uh, from, from ETSADE. You know, I've developed my career at ETSADE since then. Um, I'm a marketing faculty. My area is international marketing. And from a pedagogical point of view, 
I've been doing lots of research uh, on case studies and case research and case publication. Actually, I was quite involved when the Jesuit global uh, case series was, uh, was uh, founded and I became part of the editorial board. At Sade, I have had different administrative positions. Uh, in the 90s, I was in charge of the MBA um, for five years or six, and then I went back to teaching. Um, then I was asked to develop our uh, entire portfolio of Master of Science programs, which I did for a few years, coming back uh, to uh, you know teaching again. And then in 2014, I was asked to become the dean of the business school. Uh, so I'm in my sixth year now as dean. Uh, so uh, a little about uh, ESADE. ESADE was founded in 1958. And it was founded uh, by the initiative of a number of people from the Barcelona business community uh, who felt at that time the need of a business school, which was not a concept existing in, in Spain at the time. So they approached the uh, Society of Jesus and then with the Jesuits, they, they founded what today is ESADE. So our uh, governance model is probably different from other uh, Jesuit institutions in the sense that half of our board of trustees is appointed by the Society of Jesus and the other half of trustees uh, are appointed by, by what we call the civil society, which is the business community and also uh, uh, lawyers, because uh, a few years afterwards, Esade also uh, opened a law school, which has been quite uh, successful as well. So, uh, I mean, we have around 10,000 uh, people who every year they come through our um, uh, programs. Uh, 4,500 of them are people who are enrolled in degree programs, bachelor, uh, master programs, PhDs. And then we have like 5,500 people who are attending some executive education course, shorter or larger. Uh, we have our main campuses in Barcelona and San Cugat, which is a, a town located like 15 kilometers away from downtown Barcelona. And we also have a campus in Madrid. And altogether, we have um, 150 uh, full-time faculty, um, the majority of them from the business school, around 130. And then we also have some uh, um, faculty members from the law school. And uh, yeah, more or less, this is uh, in a nutshell what uh, what is. Thank you. Christina? OK, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today with you. Uh, so thank you, Joe. I also want to thank you, David, and all the committee that organized this conference. Uh, my name is Claudia Bittencourt. Uh, I've been dean of Unicinos Business School for two years and a half by now. Uh, before that, I was the graduate, uh, the head of graduate business program for five years. And I've been working at the university for 24 years by now. Um, besides the manager activity, I continue teaching and researching mainly subjects related to dynamic capability and social innovation. Uh, my background is uh, in HR, and um, I also um, was a visiting researcher at the University of Queensland in 2003. Um, I was a visiting researcher at the University of Lisbon in 2007, and I was visiting uh, researcher also in some uh, a couple of universities in the U.S., UTPA and the Thunderbird University. And more recently, last year, I was a visiting research at TU in Dortmund, Germany. Um, so uh, let, let me uh, talk about the university that I work for. So I, I work for Unicinos University, which is a university located in the southern area of Brazil. Uh, we celebrate our 50th anniversary last year. And um, we have two campuses, one in São Leopoldo, our green campus, uh, 
we to have uh, the tech park and some technological institutes. Uh, we also have a couple of companies inside of the campus and some multinationals as well, such as SAP and Agate Micron from Korea. Um, in Puerto Alegre, our campus is bright new. We launched the campus three years ago. Uh, at the university, we have about 25,000 students. And uh, at the business school, we have about 3,600, more or less. Uh, we organized in uh, six uh, schools, um, business school, law, uh, health, uh, creative industry, and I think I missed one, ah, and humanities. Um, I think that's all for now. So I'm uh, looking forward to share some information about what we've been doing in uh, at Unicinus in this context of uh, COVID and inspired by the new paradigm. Okay, thank you, thank Claudia. You. Uh, so you can see we have a variety of uh, different institutions represented on our panel, uh, a variety of different disciplines across the deans. Uh, the one thing that is in common, all these people have been in Jesuit education for a long time. There's over a hundred years of experience in Jesuit business education on our panel. So it's gonna be terrific. Uh, to start off will be uh, Donna Repacholi. She's gonna talk about some of the things that she's been working on at Fordham. Donna? Hopefully everybody can see my screen, yes? So what I'm gonna talk a little bit about is how we used the Inspired Paradigm Project to make change on at our business school and how we really used it you know, to unify and think about a lot of the different things that we were already doing. And part of it um, you know, for us and, and all of us as, at Jesuit schools, at the heart of what we do is the mission of the school. So about four years ago, we took a fresh look at our mission and, you know, the faculty, you know, were very intentional about the words that went into the mission and they really do align with what the inspired paradigm is really speaking about. And, you know, I put in red a few of the words that I, I think are different, inspire and empower positive global change, developing compassionate business leaders. And you know, the faculty um, worked on this and endorsed it, and we aspire to be a worldwide leader in socially conscious business education and ensure that our students have these mindsets and capabilities. So this is really at the heart of what the project was about. So for, at least for me as the Dean of the Gabelli School, I had a little bit um, of an advantage in the sense that our faculty were, uh, had already bought into a lot of these themes the language was different. So I, you know, I thought it was really important to share the Inspired Paradigm document early on. And I shared it with a small group of faculty administrators and other key stakeholders and got feedback. The document that you all are seeing was the result of a number of iterations. And uh, what was um, fortunate for the Gabelli School was that a lot of our faculty were involved in some of those iterations. And what ended up happening is we ended up with a group of champion faculty who were very interested in thinking about what they were already doing and how does that fit into the framework and how does that align with what Jesuit pedagogy is all about. And they were really inspired to try a lot of different things and I really encourage them to pilot things and not to worry so much if it doesn't all work out perfectly, but let's just think about what it is we're doing and what do we have to change. So the group really looked at the areas that the Inspired Paradigm uh, focused on. You know, basically it's around the business curriculum. It's about Ignatian pedagogy and, and how are we using that? And you know, to many of the faculty's surprise, they really are using that already. They hadn't been thinking about that it was called that, but it's what they were doing already. And then we're really focused on essential skills in addition to educating the students. What do they need? to succeed in the next century in this fourth industrial revolution. And then another key part of the way we approach business education is through partnerships and how do we engage key stakeholders. And a number of um, 
previous speakers spoke about this, but I will mention that. So just quickly on the business curriculum, the faculty realized that unless we infuse the themes in core courses, not all students are gonna be exposed to this. So at the undergraduate level, we redesigned the first year course, which is called the ground floor. And the students are sent over the summer, the sustainable development goals. And they're asked to really think about businesses that they might want to engage in around these goals. And we created a project that all the, the 640 first year students have to complete, which is around a business that addresses one of the SDG goals. And in partnership with Phillips Van Heusen, we have a big challenge. So there's a lot of energy around it. And it really is um, designed to be a core piece of the school's uh, first year. But we've also continued throughout the years. In the sophomore year, we have social innovation cohorts. As uh, Hunter Lovins mentioned, we have uh, sustainability reporting and students can become certified in this. And at the graduate level, we really revitalized our MBA program, which now has service projects and ethics course and a variety of electives. These are just a few curricular ideas. On the Ignatian um, pedagogy, the faculty began to realize that they were already using this notion of context, experience, reflection, action, and evaluation. And you know, there's a number of community-engaged learning courses, which my colleague Joseph is going to talk in more detail about. But you know, for us, we worked on the marketing strategy course, and we partnered with the Fordham Road. And many of you might have seen there's been um, a lot of challenge in the neighborhood that Fordham is around this. But it was great to see the faculty partner um, with the community around business challenges. But we're also focused on helping the faculty become more knowledgeable. So we have a director of um, teaching excellence who's been organizing a series of faculty development workshops. And one was around uh, legal play, which showed them how they can introduce these topics, especially social innovation, into the courses. And then we're also thinking about co-curricularly. How can we support the essential skills, developing creativity, storytelling, agility, resilience? How do we help the students develop these mindsets through interdisciplinary projects? So we have uh, an entity called the Social Innovation Collaboratory, which brings together students across schools to solve problems around sustainable fashion, the unbanked, real world problems. We organized a social innovation day, and I think there were a lot of people that are on this that were also there, but just to talk about what we can do to really educate each other and our faculty. And one other key piece is helping the students think about what the future should be like, and we're hosting a new series with Erin Burnett of CNN around what the future is like. And then finally, you know, really using key stakeholders to advance what it is we're already doing. We have a partnership with the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, and we really are infusing sustainability accounting. Again, accounting is my discipline, so it's near and dear to my heart. But it's having a really great impact on the way students think about what we measure and how we measure things. And our partnership with PVH is around sustainable development, and they've been coming to our campus to discuss the circular economy and how the fashion industry really needs to change. And this, these partnerships gave us the idea to launch something called the Responsible Business Coalition, which is bringing together CEOs to talk about how individual industries can make change. So for us, we're taking a holistic approach and we're using this project to link together many of the things that we're already doing on our campus. So I will stop there and turn it over to my colleague. Thank you, Donna, and thank you for uh, your wonderful leading by example and keeping within our 10 minute time frame for the presentation. Uh, so next we're going to uh, hear from Rudy Ang uh, from Ateneo Manila. R Rudy? Uh, Donna, you have to unshare. Okay. There you go. I just did, you can. Share. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, with the four panelists met earlier. We decided we'd all tackle a different piece of the uh, pie. And I thought that for my presentation, I'd focus, a, I'd focus on the effort to develop a scorecard for this new paradigm. At the Ateneo, our team went over the new paradigm, I think, 
buy-in to the main principles was almost automatic, perhaps because of many years of exposure to third world realities of poverty and exposure to liberation theology. And so as we discuss how to make this new paradigm come alive, we moved beyond agreeing on the principles to what we felt were the two main tasks. The first task, as we saw it, was designing the curriculum, designing a new curriculum to match this new paradigm. Um, some see it as just improving the current curriculum or tweaking the existing curriculum. Others see it as requiring a major overhaul. And the second part would be discussing the methodology that we would use to deliver the curriculum. Because uh, our observation is that many graduates of our business schools aren't living out the values that we desire. So we need to find a methodology that's more effective, more transformative. But as we deep dive into the topic, it's that a necessary prerequisite to curriculum design would be an assessment of where we would relative to this new paradigm. So we thought it best by developing a scorecard for this new paradigm. Wanted to develop a scorecard to assess where we currently stand and also to measure our progress over time. We, we, don't, we won't know how well we're doing unless we know where we want to go and how far we've progressed to get there. And none of the existing scorecards, none of the existing evaluation tools we use for our curriculum, essentially the ones used by accreditation agencies, none of them measure along the lines of this new paradigm. So we thought we develop a new scorecard. Because it will be difficult to know what changes to make to our curriculum if we don't know what our areas of strength and weakness are relative to this new paradigm. This scorecard has to evaluate not just what we teach, but also how we teach it. So we developed what, two scorecards. And, and these are just the broad strokes. I won't go into all the details. We developed two scorecards. The first scorecard is an input-oriented scorecard. On the lateral, we would highlight the main themes of the new paradigm, which we grouped into three broad categories. Global paradigms, country and community, and person. Uh, for today's purposes, uh, the actual themes themselves are not that important. Uh, you and I might agree or disagree on what those themes should be. But the important thing is, I think, it becomes clear as we develop this part, uh, scorecard. It became clear that there was a mismatch between the main themes of the new paradigm and the content of our curricula. Under global paradigms, we, we develop themes such as uh, inclusive development, global citizenship, environmental stewardship. Under country and community, we said social justice and the common good design thinking and social innovation. Under person, we had categories like uh, spirituality, vocation of the leader, ethical decision-making and leadership, technology and analytic for decision-making. Again, this is a sampling of the themes. There are many others I just picked out for this presentation. The problem is that our schools are not organized around these themes. If our departments and our courses are basically organized around functional areas like accounting, finance, and marketing, then how do we ensure that these themes in this paradigm get the attention that they deserve? On the vertical, we said uh, we need to assess for each of these themes, we need to assess to what extent the area is emphasized or embedded in the curriculum. Is it a topic in a class or is it a topic in a few classes? Is it an elective course, a required standalone core course? Is it a central focus of the entire program? To what extent is the area integrated or synthesized with the rest of the curriculum? To what extent is this area taught of experiential learning? Because we know that a purely rational approach is unlikely to be transformational for our students. To what extent is the curriculum supported by co-curricular or extracurricular activities, outside the classroom learning experiences, outreach activities, community engagement. 
So these are the broad strokes of the uh, scorecard that we developed. There are more details, but I just took you know the, the basic outline of the scorecard. And then simultaneously, we started to develop a, an output-oriented uh, scorecard. We said, how do we know we're doing a good job unless we work to measure our output? And we said, this would be the business school graduate, and we need to develop a profile. A typical learning outcome behavior or behavioral outcomes of uh, typical programs, strategic thinking, leading groups, ability to communicate, and so forth. None of them really touch directly on the paradigm. So we said we need a second profile. Not to say this first one is unimportant, but we need to develop a second profile. Second profile that is based on this paradigm, one that will measure maybe parallel to the hungers, the uh, white paper paradigm. We need graduates who will demonstrate a strong moral compass, who will work towards positive change, will have an attitude of inclusiveness, sense of personal mission, will have room for faith and reason in their leadership styles. They will work to contribute to human development. They will have attitude for lifelong learning. So we said an input-oriented scorecard and an output-oriented scorecard is what we need to know where we stand relative to this uh, paradigm and so that we can measure progress over time. Our preliminary self-assessment based on the scorecard points out that uh, the problem is the existing framework of our traditional MBA programs is organized around functional areas, as we said. And it's unlikely, it hasn't in the past, achieved, it will be unlikely to achieve the sort of changes in our graduates that we need to achieve. An incrementalist approach, which is typical, calls on us to tweak our tests and make minor changes so that we can introduce of this paradigm in our courses. This default approach of asking every teacher to incorporate as much of the paradigm as possible into their classes would be inappropriate, perhaps even impossible for a class to do. The biggest issues of the day are ethical decision making, innovation, global sustainability, and sustainable development, but they're not the central organizing principles of our curricula. What do we need to do to ensure the totality of our curriculum de delivers the goods in terms of this new paradigm? We need to take a whole curriculum approach. So the key question is, uh, how should we structure our curriculum so that this new paradigm is at its core? What changes we need to make in the way we run our schools and programs? Implications for the way we run our schools, I thought I'd touch on this a little more because so we've already discussed curriculum so much. Implications would be on our admissions criteria and student, our student application process. Implications on the way we conduct assessment of learning, cognitive versus affect, formation versus cognition. Implications for our faculty. How do we select our faculty? How do we do our faculty development? How do we evaluate our faculty? Should we give their role as formators the same importance as their role as researchers and scholars? And what types of research should be encouraged or prioritized if we want to really fulfill this new paradigm? So I realize that my presentation raises more questions than it provides answers. But anyway, this forum is intended to be the start of a new conversation rather than the end of the ongoing ones. And I'll end my presentation there. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you. Uh, so next we'll hear from Joseph. Yes, I'm going to change to share my uh, screen. Are you able to see my screen? We can see it. Okay. So um, one of us selected a different topic uh, in a way is complementary with uh, the others. And uh, one of the things that we were discussing at, uh, at the SADE is, of course, the new paradigm has to uh, imply some changes in the curriculum. 
It implies uh, some changes in the competencies we train, but it also has to imply changes in the methodology um, that we use for, for uh, you know, educating our students. And um, changes in methodology and also changes in attitudes and changes in culture. And uh, for, that, for, for us, it's quite important to uh, put the focus on service learning. So um, what I'm going to share with you is what we are doing um, uh, in, in this uh, dimension at the SADA in service learning. Um, we still have a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, things to do. Uh, I mean, and, but I'm, I'm going to share where we are and the things that we have. So um, um, as, as Donna was saying, we have a, a group of people that have been committed to, to the project. And I think that one of the first takeaways for every dean in order to uh, you know, push the new paradigm is to have this group of champions that Donna was saying. And uh, so we've got a group of uh, people who were working on, on uh, you know, how to improve uh, the these learning methodologies. And uh, this is what we define as the, the community engaged learning. Um, which, as you know, um, is part of the credit courses of the students, uh, where the learning takes place from the active engagement of students within a community, um, working in trying to solve a real problem, and a problem that, in a way, when solving it, it creates a positive change, a positive social change based on experiential learning and and, and this is what uh, what is uh, also a very important uh, uh, element the the overall uh, purpose is to uh, you know um, have some sense of uh, um, civic engagement and responsibility so students are really aware of uh, of those problems and they feel engaged with them and responsible for trying to change um, it also helps us to increase diversity, and diversity is not here um, diversity uh, only on gender diversity or cultural diversity or ethnic diversity, but it's also diversity from different social backgrounds. And that means that uh, students have to meet people from different backgrounds and, and, and helps in, in this dimension. Um, Social justice is, is one of the guiding principles of, of this uh, experience. And um, it, th those are experiences that have a benefit uh, for all the students or the collectivity as a whole. Um, and uh, of course, it, it, it uh, helps to understand the founding principles of the common good. And last but not least, and very important, it in includes reflection, which is, you know, as you know, one of the Ignatian pedagogy principles. So people uh, became self-aware of uh, the social inequities. Um, one of the main activities that we are quite proud of at SADE, and it has been uh, going on uh, already for uh, 17 years now, is uh, something that we call the SUT, uh, which are the uh, is the acronym in in Spanish or in Catalan of the Service for University Development. It's a solidarity internship program where um, a number of uh, students from our bachelor and our master programs they spend um, an, an internship of eight to twelve uh, weeks in a developing country. Uh, doing some kind of um, management consulting project, or in the case of the students in the law school, they offer pro bono legal assistance. As, and this is part of the learning process. And uh, this is, uh, you know, they, they have a, a previous training before they go. And of course, after um, the experience, we have this part of the reflection. Here you have some pictures of some of these uh, students in, in different places, like for instance in El Salvador, when uh, um, some students were working in a marketing plan, helping a cooperative uh, of, uh, 
of uh, you know people from the agricultural world trying to improve their their um, their micro businesses or uh, another uh, case in in Nicaragua helping uh, a developing a business plan for social housing or um, in the case in Colombia with uh, students helping um, um, you know Je the Jesuit refugee service uh, um, you know and providing legal advice to immigrants so this is one of the main programs that we have been uh, um, you know uh, working in in the last few years and I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you the figures not from this year unfortunately this year the program had to be cancelled because of the obvious uh, you know uh, mobility restrictions and um, and therefore our students could not travel to uh, you know foreign locations to conduct these um, these um, uh, internships but uh, you know normally we have around we manage around 60 projects uh, uh, in a given year and, and and students typically go in teams of two so we we more or less have uh, between 110 and 120 students who are uh, doing this um, this program um, we are covering 12 countries uh, Originally, we started in Central America, uh, but uh, but we are now covering the majority of Latin America and also some uh, African countries and some Asian countries. And in total, it's like uh, 46,000 hours of work doing uh, this uh, management consulting, uh, uh, you know, functions or legal assistance. Um, Service learning is not just done at Esave um, in 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 this uh, program only the solidarity internship program, but we are also doing um, service learning in different um, courses. So uh, what you have here in the table on the left side is the uh, different programs and the different courses where service learning is applied at Esave. Uh, you know, uh, in, so, in the bachelor, for instance, we have uh, um, a course on social marketing uh, with a group of 32 students, that's an elective. Uh, we, of course, have a global summer volunteering, which is more locally based, trying to address local communities, not international communities, as the program I was presenting before. Um, we have... Uh, uh, another program which is open to the students of the uh, law school and the business school uh, and has to do with uh, training in, in social leadership through communication skills. Um, that, well, uh, we have another group of 40 students. Our law school uh, is uh, also offering different courses. So in total, we had uh, 377 students uh, close to 400 students uh, who were going through service learning in, in, in the last year. But this is a, a coverage that we're, we are not very happy with because our ambition, and that's the uh, objective of our strategic plan, is to reach 80% of all undergraduate students and all the MSc students in at least one service learning activity during the um, during their studies. Uh, we are, as you see in, in the current figures, still far from reaching this objective, but we have three years to go. Uh, we are, uh, you know, investing a lot in uh, the creation of new courses, in trying to convince faculty members to, um, you know, use service learning as a methodology, in, uh, as a learning methodology in their course. And uh, this is what we, um, are planning to do. So um, um, I will be happy to share with you afterwards um, more information if, if you need to. And, and thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Joseph. And uh, our final presentation will be from Claudia. Claudia? Yes, one second. Okay. Uh, Probably you see my slides by now. So um, 
Uh, I'm talking about the new paradigm for this new normal situation, but uh, focus on um, the situation that you're facing in Brazil and especially the self area where the Unicinus is located. So, okay. Um, COVID-19, as you know, has accelerated some changes and brought many hard lessons, but not necessarily. Um, it accelerates the implementation of the new paradigm. It reinforces the need for this new paradigm, but it does not change the situation by itself. So I'm going to first talk about some issues in Brazil in general. And I start talking about education. And um, probably most of universities in the whole world have to change rapidly the way that they teach and uh, transfer the presential classes to virtual environment. In Brazil, it's not different. Uh, most universities convert uh, to online education, except the public universities, um, because they decided not to do it. They decided to cancel the classes, uh, and they argue that they want to prevail with the equity. Uh, what I mean by that? Uh, in Brazil, internet is not for everyone. So uh, most of the students that uh, uh, participate in the, in the public education, uh, they don't have access to internet. So that's why the federal university or public university decided to cancel the class. Uh, COVID-19 has also increased the social and economic inequalities. And to give an example, uh, only in the first quarter of 2020, the unemployment rate was 12.2. And unfortunately, also the degradation of Amazon forest is even worse. It increased by, for 34% last May. So um, my question is, uh, this adaptation to online education accelerate digital transformation? Could this crisis inspire us to put the inspirational paradigm into practice? Well, I give you some examples of what you've been doing at Unicinus. Um, so all, I selected three examples to talk about today. And the three examples, they uh, bring back the importance of solidarity, collectiveness, and integration. So the first project, is about um, a solidarity project. It's uh, a project that starts with um, some undergraduate initiatives and uh, they have support by some faculties as well. And now uh, you have this project dedicated to small business. It's based on the mentoring activity, especially due to the, the economic crisis that is even worse due to the pandemic. And uh, you are in the second phase of the project by now. In the first phase, uh, we supported 67 small companies. And the second phase now is open for new application. The second example, I want to point out the collectiveness. Uh, so for the first time, you have the three uh, leading universities in Porto Alegre. That's the, the capital where we are located. Um, the public university, the Catholic university, and Unicinus, they get together and they create this, what you call, Alliance for Innovation. You also have the partnership of the city hall and community. And the idea is that uh, integrate all community, including the private sector and public sector as well, in order to think about uh, the problems that Porto Alegre is facing by now. And the idea is that to make Porto Alegre a more attractive city and promote innovation and especially engage all the community and the solution of the local problems. So this group, they get together and they selected 24 projects. Uh, and one of the projects actually is based on the support for small business inspired by the first project that I just mentioned. So at this time you have the three universities uh, acting together to help this small business. 
Um, the next example that uh, I selected for today, it's about integration. Integration uh, between undergraduate and graduate students. So um, at Unicinus, uh, we create a team uh, that participate at the HSC competition, HSC Montreal, uh, with partnership with UNUS Institute. Uh, this activity they call social business creation. And uh, at Unicinus, uh, we create a project that we call Mission Amusement that uh, aims to provide some solutions to late adoption. So um, this project is based on uh, approximating families and orphans so that they can uh, know each other better. So we have a specific situation in Brazil. About 5,000 ch children today, they don't have families and about 44,000 uh, families are looking for children. The problem is that most of the family, they look for children under four for adoption. So, uh, and uh, it's, the situation is even worse because 90% of the orphans are between 80 and 17 years old. So we can all imagine the, the impact of this kind of project in Brazil. Well, anyway, um, these three projects, they uh, include some specificities that I want to call attention that are related to the new paradigm. So uh, in the first project, I want to call attention about uh, this activity that start as a project, but now is an academic activity. So we consider credits and uh, you validate competencies. So we create a um, platform that we call Unicinus Lab. And this platform, the student, they can select it, some optional activities, academic activities, and uh, they involve different kind of activities, lang languages, social projects, and different kinds of games, and um, uh, some activities that explore some competencies that you believe are important for uh, this uh, new paradigm. And uh, the second uh, project, actually, uh, they uh, point out the importance to involve the stakeholders in the solution of some problems that you are facing. So it's very important, uh, the partnership uh, between university and uh, community in general. And uh, this also makes attention to the impact that you cause in the society. And the last one um, is about to integrate our student in an international competition, uh, but, but also highlight some important points related to a nation paradigm. So I want to call attention uh, to the importance to recognize the context, the experience, the reflection, action, and evaluation uh, to create the social business that start as a project, but now need to be implemented in the society, in the case in Porto Alegre. So it's a quite challenge for our students. And the uh, other point that's very important is that uh, you put our students in contact with vulnerable people. Well, in Brazil, um, you have many options to, to doing that, of course. But in this case, we selected an excluded community which is abandoned children. Well, all these cases uh, is concerned about social issues, but they also have some, some point in common. That's the premise that becoming is more important than simply knowing. Um, so it's, it's essential for us to develop some kind of uh, competencies, leadership competencies to deal with uh, humanities and technical education. And so despite all these uh, difficulties and uncertainties that all of us are facing by now, we really believe that uh, we can have precious learning, especially based on common good and service to others. So um, I, that's my last slide and I bring this quotation by Bonventura de Souza Santos. Uh, he points out uh, 
the coronavirus as a crew pedagogue. So you all have very hard lessons, but the question is, have you learned? Well, one of the, the learning that I can share with you uh, is humble lesson. So um, uh, first you need to uh, um, be aware about the situation and then be open to new learning so that it is possible to think about real implementing the new inspirational paradigm. Um, but also these lessons uh, teach us about to be uh, humble. So I'm talking about humility to know that you don't have all the answers. Humility uh, to, rec to uh, uh, recognize that sometimes we need help. And sometimes you need to be uh, someone who is going to help. And especially, uh, we need to be open to listen the most uh, affected uh, stakeholders, I mean our community. So um, I hope that uh, based on these reflections, you can uh, not exactly accelerate the implementation of inspirational paradigm, but be aware about the necessity to really ref reflect about it and put the inspirational paradigm for Jesuit business education into practice. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Claudia. So we've had uh, four terrific presentations, all of them going in a very different direction. Uh, the first one about um, how to socialize the new paradigm and bring that into the back of the uh, Somebody needs to mute themselves, I think. Uh, Muted. I'm the one who's talking with that. Sorry. Uh, let me start at the beginning. So we had four terrific presentations. And uh, they all went in a very different direction. Uh, the first one was about how to uh, socialize the new paradigm into the uh, school, into the faculty and staff of the school. Uh, the second was the importance of developing a scorecard uh, to uh, drive and, and uh, measure progress. The third was the importance of service learning, which is called out specifically in the document. And the final was how to uh, respond to the COVID-19 crisis uh, within the parameters of the new paradigm. So all very interesting perspectives. Uh, I know there's a few questions coming up in the chat, which I will try to monitor, but I'm going to exercise my prerogative as the, if, as the moderator and ask a few questions uh, to start us off. Okay, so we have uh, about uh, 40 minutes, so we'll be able to, I think, get into a lot of different questions. You know, the first question I have is what kinds of incentives and disincentives does a school and its faculty and staff face in pursuing this new inspirational paradigm? Incentives and disincentives. So who, who amongst our panelists would like to go on that one first? I can start, Joe. Thank you. So I'll focus on the incentives. I think that the timing is absolutely right. Uh, when you look at what's happening, uh, not only with our students' preference for socially responsible businesses, but also for big companies recognizing the importance of this. I mean, in the United States, you know, the, the, the big news in August was, you know, Jamie Dimon coming out with, you know, the business roundtable statement about the purpose of a corporation really being much broader and including stakeholders. So I, I think that the, the fear that, you know, this might not be mainstream is gone. So, you know, I, I think there is an incentive because I think this is what the, the, the students want. And as faculty learn more and more about it and understand how it aligns with what they're already doing, uh, I, I think there are real um, incentives and it, it is the future. 
uh, and it's what our students will need to succeed in the fourth industrial revolution. So I see, you know, a lot of upside and I'm trying not to focus on the downside. Uh, but, you know, again, I think the timing is right um, from many different um, perspectives. Thank you. I'd like to follow. Um, I would say that um, from the incentive point of view, as deans, our main concern should be um, to, um, you know, recognize as pedagogical innovation all the efforts that faculty members do for, you know, doing uh, this change, changing courses, changing curriculum, exploring new pedagogies, innovation. You know, the, the most, uh, let's say, resource of a faculty member is time. And they have multiple incentives in different um, time-consuming activities, uh, research and publication. They have to teach. They, they have to do a number of things. So we, we as teams, have to put the right incentives in 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 place. So really, faculty members uh, can devote their additional uh, time in rethinking the curriculum, the courses. Um, doing more interdisciplinary approaches with colleagues from other departments of other areas, and um, and then uh, you know um, devote time really to 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 do that 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 change. Uh, and and the second thing that I believe we have to create are spaces spaces for dialogue, uh, where they can you know share their experiences, the best practices, the lessons learned, uh, to see how things can be changed. And, and of course, uh, this has a, you know, uh, an effect that, uh, uh, you know, really can, can reach other faculty members when they see um, best practices shared by leading faculty. Thank you, Joseph. Rudy? Yeah, I'd like to chime in with a totally different perspective, which is about hiring for mission. I think uh, really one of the things we don't always do is to hire for mission. And if we hire faculty and administrators who believe in this vision and mission, then the opportunity to create something so aligned with our goals as a Jesuit business school, that would be the most powerful incentive for them. So more than any monetary rewards, more than any recognition, I think, if we hire people for mission, then the ability to make a difference in these areas that are important to us, I think will be the most important incentive for anyone. Great, thank you. Christina, did you have anything? Well, I could talk about some uh, disincentives. Um, well, uh, First of all, uh, as a change, you always face a kind of natural resistance and the desire to keep ourselves in the comfort zone. But uh, it's not only about that. I think uh, if I, I consider the, the context of Brazil currently, uh, we face a very difficult situation, not only because of the COVID-19, but because uh, the polarization that uh, has installed in our country. So um, we have a very difficult agenda to deal with in terms of uh, economic, education, healthy. And um, so uh, sometimes people just put uh, sustainability very far from economic uh, uh, elements. And uh, if you face this kind of polarization, uh, it will be very hard uh, to move forward to implement the Jesuit paradigm. And uh, unfortunately, due to all the situation, usually uh, people prioritize economic issues by now. And the uh, uh, university has a central role on that. And uh, most of the university, they are working together to try to, to change this a little bit. But uh, it seems that the central point of the, the question is missing by now because people are so concerned about surviving. So uh, everybody think about today, not about tomorrow. 
and uh, it's one day each day that you live and you try to deal with. So in the last month, you changed the Ministry of Education three times, the Our Health Ministry four times, and the, it's, it's a little bit crazy situation that you are facing by now. So I think that the current situation is something that really uh, hamper the development of the Jesuit paradigm, not because the situation by itself, but because people are moving the focus to other, other uh, situations that um, uh, they can solve the problem because they are uh, um, breaking the problem and the small problems and uh, they don't reach the, the center of the question, uh, in my opinion. Thank you, Joe. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, the next question is, there's uh, some discussion in the chat about doing it in an incremental way versus, you know, starting everything over, starting from scratch. And we had two examples earlier this morning, Vermont and Bard, that basically took it from scratch. So, uh, Rudy, you talked a little bit about this in your presentation. I got the sense that it was more, you've got to start over. So maybe I'll ask you to go first on this question. Incremental well, versus start from scratch. Well, two things. I think purely as a thought exercise, we need to develop an ideal curriculum that is free of any constraints. Simply as a thought exercise, not something we can implement tomorrow, but something we can aspire to. Because without this ideal curriculum, we don't know where we're headed or where we want to get to. So, so for me, the exercise of designing this ideal curriculum isn't necessarily because we can use it tomorrow, but because we need to know where we'd like to go so that at some point we can get there. Um, I, I, I believe that we need to incorporate these ideas, these themes in the paradigm in our basic MBA curriculum or basic business curriculum. Um, we, we had two very ex excellent examples earlier, but part of the problem with these programs is that they're niched. And if we really want to make a difference, we need to bring it to the mainstream of our business curricula. So it's great to have niche programs and perhaps we should need more of those, but we also need to look at how we can incorporate more and more of these themes into our bread and butter business programs because that's where the bulk of our students are and that's how we're going to change the world thank you donna you want to go next yeah i i would agree uh i, I think we have to take both approaches uh we have to incrementally change but we also have to be thinking about more bold change and you know maybe that's as rudy suggested in a niche program that we can then move over into larger programs uh, but I think we have to change our existing programs, especially schools that have large existing programs. We have to change them and we have to make sure that the core courses, and I said this earlier, are, are where the content occurs because we can't rely on a student taking an elective in sustainable business or an elective that explains uh, you know, the sustainable development goals. And, and the other thing that, you know, um, building on what Chris, uh, Claudia was saying is, you know, the students need to experience some of the, these economic challenges. And in the U.S., for better or worse, many of our students have not experienced it firsthand. And, you know, I, I think them being with the community will really change the way that they think about, uh, you know, business. So these service learning and these immersion programs uh, are really have to be an integral part of their development. Thank you. Joseph? Yes, Joe, um, I, al I also agree that you have to drive both. Uh, you know, one of the problems is that when you have a very established program, a huge program, large in size, uh, you know, any change that you want to introduce uh, is a difficult, is a challenge, because there are inertias, there are resistance, uh, and you end up discussing with, uh, you know, different departments. Okay, but now how many hours do I have to teach? I have to teach less hours than before because you want to do whatever. So, I, I mean, th there are a, a number of things that, you know, prevent you to, to go uh, to a radical change. 
Uh, but for instance, we, at the Sade, we, ha we are just now designing a completely new bachelor degree. And it's a bachelor degree that will be called a Bachelor in Transformational Business and Social Impact. And in this bachelor degree, you know, uh, I only put one condition, and, and that is no department can own any course. I mean, all courses have to be shared by at least two departments. Uh, all the majority of, majority of courses have to be project-based. At the end of every year, I want a capstone, which is also based on experiential learning. Uh, so, so you set a completely different, uh, you know, framework and rules of the game, and then probably you can you can do a much more radical innovation that you know changing a bit, uh, you know, career uh, where you can probably not make a huge transformation. But again, as Rudy was saying, I mean, with this new program, we are going to start with a small number of people testing the program, and then. Uh, expanding it and hopefully you know transferring uh, best practices and learnings to the other programs but uh, at the end of the day you have to explore both ways uh, do some changes uh, you know and do some radical innovation with a completely uh, new program coming from scratch Great. thank you Claudia yes I agree with my colleagues I think uh, you need to go with <laughs> both ways uh, so uh, keep improving continuous um, uh, continuously the, the, the curriculum but also sometimes you need to try and uh, go to a different path for example at uh, Unicinos we create uh, a new undergraduate program based on uh, what you call Jesuit DNA uh, and this problem point out some uh, specific elements, such as personal purpose. So uh, you explore experience and employability. We also work with uh, competencies and competencies for the future, but also competence related to the knowledge area and uh, some uh, more technical competencies. Uh, the other element that's very important is mentoring. So we work with a kind of certifications and uh, we try to, to get the curriculum more flexible. As I, uh, I said before, you have this platform on Sinus Lab, uh, which uh, the students can choose uh, some courses and um, they also have a kind of competition because these, uh, these courses, they give you some points related to different competencies and sometimes the students just compete with each other and uh, it's it's a little bit fun and uh, you also work with the the traditional disciplines um, uh, the functional areas but i think the, the 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 most innovative part of this curriculum is that uh, we create five disciplines so the student, they can choose which path they want to, uh, to, to go through. So you have entrepreneurship. Um, the student, if they decided in the last year of the program, they can incubate their business in our tech park, for example. Uh, they also can choose social innovation and uh, they would be involved in the social project and something that will impact uh, the community. They also could choose internationalization and uh, then you have the options of uh, a, a, a agreement to have a double degree. And if decided to keep uh, studying and um, in depth some research, they can try some uh, courses of our master program. Uh, and of course, you also have the possibility to uh, be more specialized in the functional area such as marketing, HR, finance, etc. But however, I did believe that uh, you can gradually change our curriculum and uh, especially uh, involve our, our students in this kind of change. Thank you. Uh, so looking at the chat, there's a bit of a discussion around 
you know, is there a market for the new paradigm? Will we be able to recruit students to a program that uh, looks like this? Um, Donna, you actually addressed this earlier in one of the questions when you said, with the business roundtable and some other developments, it's become much easier to step out on this. But I'm getting a sense that at least some faculty feel like higher administration, maybe above the business school, doesn't believe there's a market and doesn't want to go there. So maybe you could start us off uh, on that topic. I think if you um, frame it um, around what employers are looking for, uh, that may be something that higher administration might uh, listen more carefully to. Again, many business schools, for better or worse, one of the things that we're measured on is, is the outcomes of our students. And if you look at what employers are looking for, they're looking for exactly this, critical thinkers, storytellers, uh, students that are uh, committed to society. So the employers are looking for these types of students. And, uh, you know, I, I think by starting there, it can help you make the case. And I also think that, you know, on the student side, many students are opting into this. I mean, you know, we see it in our own school. Um, you know, we created, uh, we have an integrated core. I mentioned everybody takes this one ground floor class, which is focused on sustainable development goals and, and uh, business. But in the, into the second year, they take an integrated core and students get to choose whether they want to go into social innovation cohorts or not. And originally we had one section, now we're up to three. So I think that there is more demand on both sides, from the student and from the employer. And as the dean, our responsibility is to make the case so that uh, you know, the, the administration sees this, that it all makes sense. Great, thank you. Rudy, I know you have some thoughts. Yeah, um, to my mind, this might be the business schools still need to deliver the goods, right? I mean, want to put all of this in there, but we still need to deliver the goods. And uh, in terms of recruiting students, we do, I don't know if you will agree with this, but we do a bit of a bait and switch tactic with our young high school kids as we recruit them. So in our recruitment, we don't say come to us and be a man for others, right? We talk about the hiring rates of our young graduates. We talk about the exciting careers that they have. Then when they're with us, then that's the task of formation. When they're with us, we work with them to form them so that they, we try to mold them into the type of graduates we would like to see. But first, well, we have to deliver the goods. So we, ourselves, we have no problem filling up our undergraduate business student slots. We're one of the most popular business schools in the country, and we can be highly selective because first and foremost, our graduates have excellent careers. And so as we are able to select really the top tier high school graduates come to us for the undergrad program. It's when they're with us that our formation programs kick in. And, and so it's a bit like a bait and switch tactic, but uh, we do that unless you also deliver the goods. Great, thank you. Joseph, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting question. Uh, there are how many? Uh, 50,000 business schools all around the world. Uh, so the market is there. It's an issue of differentiation. So uh, I, what I cannot understand is um, how we think we are not going to have a market when we are not just uh, you know, teaching competent people, but also uh, we are teaching uh, ethical behavior and uh, trying to be a force for good and trying to uh, be responsible, uh, more sustainable. Uh, we are trying to get a more, a better world uh, with more social justice. In addition to the competent people, we are enforcing many other things. So on the, on the opposite, I mean, I, I believe it's an opportunity for us to stand out and to differentiate from the rest of the other 49,900 business schools which are there and who cannot uh, offer the added value that we can add. 
Great. Thank you. Claudia? Uh, thank you, Joe. I don't have anything to add. I uh, agree with my colleagues. Great. Thank you. You know, I would just add a, a few things on that. Um, there's, met, there's never been a better time to move in this direction as far as convincing higher administration that this is the way to go. I mean, you have Laudato C, you have the vocation of the business leader, you have our document. Um, you know, how can a president and a provost and so forth uh, take a look at those and not say this is something they want to get behind? But as Donna said, it's up to the school to uh, make a compelling case. And we'd like to think that all the Jesuit business schools around the world, the some 90 or so of them, uh, that this is a direction that every president and uh, chief academic officer would support. Uh, so uh, let me ask, uh, uh, change directions here a little bit and maybe um, look to the future, right? Like five years from now, uh, you're still the dean in your business school. And what does success look like? five years from now in your school. Instead of picking on Don all the time, I'll start with Claudia. Let her go first. Okay. Well, five years from now, it's a very short time to make a big change. <laughs> so I think uh, we will uh, move forward to the implementation of the inspirational Jesuit paradigm but I don't think uh, we will finish our work by now. I think uh, you have you know, a long-term work to uh, get the community together, not only our students. So it's not only a matter of curriculum, uh, but also the impact that our, our student will have in the society in general. So it's a long-term commitment. And uh, I believe it'd be better than today but uh, you still have much work to do. Thank you. Uh, Rudy, you want to go next? Well, I think that's the whole point of the scorecard that we're developing. Uh, an input scorecard to measure whether we're making progress in curriculum, but more importantly, the output scorecard to see what's happening to our graduates. I agree with Claudia, five years is a bit short, a time frame. I think in five years you can measure your progress in terms of inputs, in terms of changes made to the curriculum, but for outputs or in terms of what students are doing, I think will be the frame in five years. But in the, the, our, the child, our scorecard is to put in the metric. What percentage of students have gone on to develop work? What percentage of our students are leading organizations business organizations responsibly? What kind of leadership are they showing wherever they are? I mean, just measuring and seeing the impact that our graduates have, I think is one of the most important ways for us to measure our success. Thank you. Uh, Joseph? Yeah, well, five years from now, I will not be the dean. That's to start because I am uh, in my second, uh, you know, term of appointment, and, and so I have still two years to go, but then it's over. We have a, a limitation on the mandates. But, you know, uh, how are we going to measure success? I, I mean, of course, measuring success can be done with different indicators. I mean, we can have different indicators, and, and, and I believe that Rudy earlier uh, showed this scorecard, and, and I, I'm sure that we can put in every box of this grid uh, a number and measure that. And we can also measure the impact that our students uh, really, uh, really make. But to me, the real measure of success is going to be to which extent we can uh, have on board all the people in the business school. I mean, because so far uh, we have mentioned we have a group of champions uh, 10, 15, 20 faculty members who are enthusiastic about that. Yeah, but they are the enthusiasts that always will join these kind of projects. The, the, the issue is how we can reach the rest of people and how we can reach also the rest of the staff, not just faculty, and, and how we can uh, promote this change of behavior. Uh, and that's really uh, going to take time because it has to do with changing 
uh, the culture in, in our institutions and, and to make it more aligned. Um, I mean, I'm sure that in all our institutions, we have excellent people teaching an ethics course, but the challenge is to talk about ethics in every single course in our curriculum. The, that, that, that the, ethics, uh, the ethical issue has to be a discussion in a finance course and in an accounting course and in a marketing course and in an HR course because behind any decision a manager has to make, there is a dilemma and an ethical dilemma behind. So we, and the same for sustainability. I mean, sustainability cannot be just a fantastic course taught by an enthusiastic faculty member who really believes in that, but we have to talk about sustainability in a marketing course and in a HR course and in an accounting course and in operations course. So uh, these topics have to be embraced by all our community. And, and, and that's the main challenge. The success would be if we make this happen. Thank you. Donna. Yeah, I agree with all my colleagues. There's lots of pieces to the puzzle of success. Uh, one thing that we haven't talked much about, which I think is crucially important, is faculty research. And in five years, I'd like to see even more faculty doing research that transforms the way we do business in a, a sustainable way. So I, I think that we have to uh, really encourage and promote the research of our faculty to change the way business practice is done, uh, you know, as another measure of, of success. In, in addition to what does our curriculum look like and what are the student outcomes? Where are they going to work? And how aware are they of their role in society? All important, but I think we, we don't wanna forget about the role of business faculty in generating new knowledge that will change the way business is done. Great, thank you. So I wanted to build off of that statement you made about faculty, Donna, and go back to something Joseph talked about earlier about, you know, faculty have so many different responsibilities and are, are pulled so many different ways and it's important to uh, provide them the support to uh, pursue the inspirational paradigm. Um, maybe, Joseph, you could start off and give us examples of some of the things you've done along those lines, and then maybe some of the other deans can join in. Okay, uh, I mean, the first thing, as I was saying before, it's that you have to recognize the time that they will devote to, uh, to innovate and to uh, change uh, things. So you have to provide them this recognition in their annual work plan. Uh, and that's probably one of the first incentives that you need. Uh, second thing, uh, you have to leverage on the champions. And those champions can be also practicing, quote unquote, by example, by, by, by sharing success stories and how a course has improved uh, and the student satisfaction and the learning has improved a lot thanks to uh, you know, changing methodology and with a no, new approach. Is, is going to have a, you know, a way of convincing um, other faculty members also to try and to experiment. Uh, in a way, we need to uh, take people out of their comfort zone. Huh? The easy thing is, okay, I'm, it's business as usual, that's my comfort zone. Uh, so how do you manage and what are the strings that you pull here? Uh, it, it has to do with uh, you know, convincing people uh, sharing best practices and examples, and and also recognizing what they do uh, to, to begin with. Just a follow-up question. You mentioned the need for innovation. How do you uh, encourage faculty to be innovative in this well, context? It should be in the DNA of any faculty to innovate. Huh? Uh, if not, we have a problem. Uh, you know, anyone should have as part of uh, his or her, uh, you know, way of approaching um, the, the, the wish of changing things and renovating things. The main problem is that sometimes we are so busy that, uh, you know, we tend to replicate things and, and we do not, uh, uh, you know, uh, change uh, things uh, so, so often. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I believe that the, it should be a, a must for any faculty member to be innovative and to be changing things and updating things. Great, thank you. Uh, somebody else want to comment, Donna? I want to just jump in here because, you know, the, the virus has been awful and horrible. And, you know, at the same time, it has, um, at least in our school, encouraged uh, a lot of innovation and a lot of innovative thinking around collaboration, which, you know, I, I think we can use. And I think tomorrow is going to really be talking more about this broadly. But how can one faculty member who is, uh, you know, a subject matter expert in a particular area share their content so that all the students can benefit from it. So I, I think that um, we're all beginning to think more creatively about how we can share content and, and use our experiences. And I also think that, you know, most faculty right now are rethinking their courses because they're realizing that they're going to be pretty much, you know, uh, teaching hybrid at best. Uh, and you know, this could be an opportunity to introduce you know, the, the Je Jesuit pedagogy. Many uh, of faculty are using it, they just don't realize it, you know, especially around context, evaluation, reflection. So I do think that there are some opportunities uh, for innovation that uh, faculty can take advantage of right now. Great, thank you. Claudia, do you have anything on this one? Yeah, I think... Um... I don't know. I, I just think that sometimes what you need is to be more flexible and give some room to faculties uh, to create things differently because sometimes they have so much work to do and, uh, you know, some operational things and some routine things to do. And uh, if you give them more space, I think they will be much more creative. Here, I think uh, we are very lucky to have very innovative faculty. But sometimes uh, they are very busy. And uh, the easiest way is to keep doing what you've been doing. And so I think if you, if you could be more flexible and give uh, more room for faculty, you'd be great. Thank you. Rudy? Just to echo what uh, Joseph said about champions. I think one of the first things I did was recruit a core group of seven or eight faculty who could be champions. So chose them because they believed, I felt that they believed in the principles of this paradigm and that they would be inspired to do something about this. And uh, I also chose them because I felt they could be influential and that they could attract other faculty to this effort and try to make sure there were some younger people there. I'm only a few years away from retirement. So <laughs> need to recruit younger people, I put them on board and so that they can take on the lead in the future. So putting together a team of people who will be champions with the passion, with the ability to recruit others or to infect others with this passion, and then younger people to take over from us. Great, thank you for that. Well, I think we're pretty close to our limit of um, stopping at at least 10 a.m. Pacific Coast time, one o'clock uh, New York time, and many other times around the world. I uh, really want to thank our four panelists. They've done a terrific job, provided us very uh, distinctive opinions and perspectives on some important questions. I can tell from the uh, chat session that you really, um, you know, inspired and provoked people into, uh, into thinking more about these things and acting uh, well beyond uh, when this day is over and tomorrow is over as well. So. Really appreciate um, you all, the preparation you made to be prepared for this and your willingness um, to participate. And I think now I should uh, probably hand it back to Nikki. Is that right? I'm going to add it over to uh, Mike Pearson to give us a little bit of uh, intro into tomorrow. Uh, wow. Okay. Well, thank you all uh, for this uh, starting point because tomorrow is the opportunity to uh, work together and maybe carve out some of the rooms that that uh, the deans were saying that we we should be using as faculty. And uh, so tomorrow the the program will be focused on the pedagogical piece, not research, but how we can collaborate in terms of the new paradigm aligned 
pedagogy is specifically, I think there is a, a hope that we, that we can focus on the core courses and redesigning core courses. We all know we, that's not enough. And that's a starting point. So we'll have uh, groups for core courses that uh, we ask you to select into and it's in the program and it's finance, economics, marketing, management, supply chain and operations and those subjects. And then we also have a session on new courses for which you might want to uh, think about like which, which novel uh, ideas should be developed. And uh, all that is started off by uh, Father Garanzini and a panel with Nancy Tuckman and uh, Mike Short and uh, Jerry White, a uh, Peace Nobel Laureate who has been thinking about the skills that we would need in this world as change makers, as those that want to set the world on fire. And so we'll get a couple of inspirations uh, before we do that kind of work. And we'll end with ideally identifying next steps and, and then see how we can move this whole project further. Thank you. So, so Michael, if I, if I may add, the Zoom link is the same as uh, this one for the, first, for the first part of tomorrow. And then for the second part, when we get into smaller groups, each uh, particular area has a different uh, Zoom link. And you should have got that information. Yep. Right. Yes. Great. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, it was great seeing so many of you and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye.